so for uh, anyone who's into uh, humor, uh, here we go. This is the kind of patient that I'm uh, typically seeing in clinical practice myself. Um, I kind of see two different uh, patient silos, those that are wellness seekers. Uh, they're looking to go from good to better. Uh, and those individuals who are health seekers, those who have problems with their health and they're looking to solve those problems. Uh, this particular patient uh, here, uh, I probably put in a split silo. I've been in clinical practice for well over 20 years now. And one of the biggest um, challenges I face is with the stress paradox. I think it's the number one North American wide silent killer. Um, and it's uh, not benign, uh, contributes to diabetes, um, heart disease, uh, even the big C, you know, cancer. Uh, so we got to crack the code on this. And of course, this isn't just about crossing our arms and our legs and meditating uh, like a Buddhist monk or learning how, uh, or for that matter, maybe even clocking more hours on the pillow, as I just heard you guys allude to, there's a lot more about quality sleep. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, uh, how to enhance sleep, how to reduce stress effectively, uh, and ultimately how to sharpen the mind. Uh, but before I move to my next slide, um, there may be humor in this slide, but there's some significant innuendos, um, and uh, I'll be coming back to this um, uh, as we go through this presentation. So it's not all uh, that humorous. I just wrote a book, um, Brain Spanners, where the theme of this book uh, was entertaining the idea of health span. So we know it's no longer about lifespan, simply the uh, you know days or weeks or years that you'll uh, experience life on this planet, but living your best life uh, in the most optimal form of health. Uh, so that's health span. Uh, brain span is all about living your best life, optimal health with full mental faculty. Uh, so some major learnings that have come out of that particular book, uh, writing that book for me, uh, starts off with this, uh, neurogenesis. Um, we have come to learn that really all we have is the brain cells that we're born into this world with. Um, you know, they mature, they create new connections, they, uh, they form uh, new friends, so to speak. And then by the age of uh, approximately, um, you know, uh, seven, eight years old, early school, um, primary school age, they die off. This is the old story we've been told, not true. Uh, there is new supply ongoing, particularly in the hippocampus in the part of the brain responsible for memory and new memories. So when you treat your brain right, we'll talk a little bit about that as well, uh, including obviously supplementing with uh, Santhenine, uh, you are enhancing neurogenesis and new supply uh, of neurons uh, on the daily. Uh, your brain is also plastic, neuroplasticity. Uh, so this concept is that we're constantly forming new connections and we're uh, disconnecting all the time. In fact, we talk a lot about memory as it's retaining um, uh, ideas and forms of, uh, of, of, of things we've learned. Uh, but memory is, is, it's just as important for a good and robust memory to forget. And so uncoupling becomes as important as coupling when it comes to brain health. And then the old Hebb's law, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. And this concept uh, it's all about how uh, when a, when a uh, cell persistently activates around another cell, uh, the connection between those two becomes stronger. Uh, and that is really driven. We are bioelectric beings. So we are not just chemistry, or as you see here, uh, neurochemicals flying between one neuron and the other. Uh, we are very much electrical. And so the depolarization of electricity that happens within the presynaptic cleft uh, that is the firing neuron, and then received in the postsynaptic cleft, the receiving neuron it is just as important. Uh, and that plays a role here as well as it relates to brain waves, as I, I heard Braxton allude to earlier, um, something that Santini can manage uh, or mitigate. And then I've come to learn uh, that there are significant genetic predispositions uh, to stress. Uh, these vary, of course, person to person. Uh, you cannot change your DNA. You can't change your genes. They are certainly what mom and dad have dealt you. Um, the cards, if you will, by analogy, and now you need to learn how to play them in this game of life. But this is the really good news of the day, maybe the last uh, decade or so, and that is you can manage genetic expression. 
So you can't change your DNA, but you can manage genetic expression. And that is ultimately through diet, lifestyle, uh, and of course, what you put into your body through supplementation. Uh, and there are ways in which we can do this. Uh, I'm going to share three genes that I've become intimately familiar with um, through my clinical practice. So again, I check uh, DNA aptitude, if you will, particularly executive function. That's learning about mood and behavior and the genes that control that. And it starts with this one very important gene called COMPT, which is an acronym that stands for catecholomethyltransferase. Um, so think of this really as an enzyme that's responsible in the brain uh, to uncouple catecholamines from their receptors. So catecholamines being dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline primarily, which signal everything from feel good reward through to stress. So the speed at which your uh, enzyme, your comp enzyme uncouples these catecholamines uh, plays a very important role. Some of us are slow, some of us are average, and some of, some of us are very, very fast. Um, another uh, genetic uh, susceptibility that I look at within the uh, executive function for mood and behavior is dopamine. We've come to learn this one as a feel-good, uh, very much reward-based neurohormone. Uh, and so this gene, the dopamine receptor D2 gene, this encodes for how many receptors of dopamine one may be blessed with within their uh, neurobiology. So some of us have a lot, uh, some of us have sort of an average moderate amount, and some of us have very few. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, as it pertains to the stress paradox, the ability to have deep and, and very effective rejuvenating sleep, and the ability to remain focused uh, and have attention and the level of alertness and um, the ability to remain uh, in the zone uh, is the ADVRA2B gene. Uh, so this gene, basically like dopamine uh, receptor gene, controls for the amount of receptors that one might have or one is blessed with within their neurobiology for adrenaline. Uh, so some of us have a lot, some of us have an average amount, and some of us have very few. All right, now I'll hit the bottom line here. Uh, whether you are a fast average or slow comp, uh, fast average or rather a lot um, average amount or a few dopamine receptors or many average or few uh, noradrenaline receptors, all factor in uh, you know, to this game of life. Uh, the trends that I've seen in clinical practice is an individual who essentially has a very slow comp. That is to say, adrenaline, noradrenaline sits in the nerve receptors for a very long time. So park that thought. They also have very few dopamine receptors. Again, this is just the clinical experience that I've had with individuals that come and see me. So this, this population will be somewhat skewed to the average population, which should make sense since, since they're often coming to me as health seekers, they've got a problem they wanna solve. And then often they will have an abundance of these noradrenaline receptors. What is the combination of this? The combination of this is somebody who ultimately uh, has a problem with focus, attention, alertness, concentration, tends within the spectrum of ADHD uh, to be on the lesser attentive side that challenges with focus, has a hard time falling asleep or maybe experiences uh, latent uh, sleep and or advanced day sleep disorders, just waking up too early in the morning and mind racing and can't fall back asleep. Um, so the idea is that the average individual coming to see me, their genetic susceptibility is one that is already more sort of shifted uh, towards having a negative experience with stress. All right, and why do we think this? Uh, there's a lot of theories being thrown around, but first it's important, I believe, to understand uh, our autonomic nervous system. So autonomic means automatic. It's uh, something we don't have to think about, such as how often our heart beats or how um, you know, often uh, we're breathing every minute, uh, the digestive uh, function in our, in our stomach and intestines and per peristalsis. All these things are happening on autopilot. But they are, however, significantly, very deeply influenced by our environment. And of course, those genes and how we feed ourselves. Um, so the two branches to the autonomic nervous system, very subconscious, unconscious part of our uh, nervous system, is the sympathetic, and that is, uh, we, we've coined this term, and we were, most of us were familiar with this, the fight or flight, uh, and parasympathetic, uh, or we call this rest and digest. 
Each of these branches are very much responsible for different things. This is a very short list. My, it's, it's not beyond theory. It's very well supported actually in the literature, but uh, I want to sort of bring up again, this concept in society, we are very much stuck uh, due to our environment, uh, due to work hours, due to, you know, so many of these, what we now have normalized uh, within society, uh, working hours, um, you know, loss of this connectivity to nature, uh, social relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly what the last few years have brought us, we are stuck within a sympathetic dominant state. Really important to understand this because this is something that sun theming can help us escape from uh, and or at least substantiate the biochemistry that helps us to better shift from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic state. So this, in my opinion, a uh, little bit beyond theoretical, it is substantiated by the literature, this ability to shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic state requires a certain type of neurochemistry. And if many of us are already dealing with the genes that shift us over uh, to this heightened state of alertness or uh, rather stress, uh, then we need that additional advantage. And I believe wholeheartedly Sun Dini, uh, can do that for us. So here's the machinery uh, that's in charge of this stress response or the fight or flight. Uh, the adrenal glands, you've got two of them. They sit up top uh, both kidneys, pyramidal type like structures. Uh, they pulse out cortisol, the notorious uh, hormone that's in charge of uh, retaining too much belly fat when we've got too much of this floating around for too long a period of time. Uh, and then the medulla, which uh, puts out uh, adrenaline into our uh, blood supply and nervous system. So the top brain centers, the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, these control for the signal that goes to these adrenal glands and says, emit uh, this adrenaline. Um, and as I alluded to early on, even if you are an individual or you know individuals who are predisposed, even genetically, uh, to a high stress uh, aptitude, uh, and their adrenals are constantly firing off, um, there are ways in which we can help these individuals out of that state, and I believe wholeheartedly uh, sun theming becomes a part uh, of that mix. And here's how I know. Uh, so in a clinical sense, uh, for well over 15 years now, not the entirety of my clinical experience, um, because this lab wasn't around at that point, uh, I started testing uninvasively neurotransmitters through urine, very good way to look at endpoints, metabolites of these neurotransmitters. So everything from serotonin to adrenaline, we talked about dopamine, uh, noradrenaline, GABA, uh, we look at all these neurotransmitters to get a good assessment as to where somebody is right now, uh, live time, uh, with respect to their brain chemistry. And what we're really looking at from uh, the advantage uh, of the inclusion of sun theming is this GABAergic type uh, um, activity. So uh, this is also in the literature that sun theming seems to increase dopamine and may manage or mitigate adrenaline and noradrenaline um, and upregulate GABA. Those are all the favorable things that we would want to see uh, when we are trying to downplay that heightened sympathetic response. Now, I want to bring this up. This is very, very important, the uh, hormetic response. So all stress is not bad. I really, really want to emphasize that. All stress is not bad. Any stress, be it physical, mental, emotional, chemical, you name it, for too long a period of time, uh, can be bad. So chronic stress is often bad, but it's all dose dependent. So if you're not already familiar with hormesis, this is a response, very much a bell curve response where too little of a dose of stress may not do anything, good or bad, too high, and ultimately it may kill you. Just the right response or just the right amount of stress, we call this the Goldilocks hormetic response, is perfect. Um, and so how do we actually activate or how do we improve uh, the Goldilocks response? Well, it has a lot to do with engaging in stress purposefully, but also, and this is the point I want everyone to remember, the take home, the speed at which we are able to go from sympathetic fight or flight to parasympathetic rest and digest. So I'm going to pop back up here. And I bring this uh, cartoon uh, back to your uh, uh, attention. And this is where I said, there's a lot of innuendo here. 
So you've got a doc with his sun cleaning prescription. This patient wants to relax faster, better. He wants to be on the cutting edge of relaxation. What he actually might be saying, unbeknownst to himself, is that he wants to go from a state of sympathetic, fight or flight stress, unable to fall asleep effectively, maybe waking up out in the middle of the night, mind racing, not being able to remember where his keys are, because you know that's what the brain does when you're in a sympathetic state. It's wanting to get out of that environment um, and come to safety. So where the keys are is not really important. Um, but he is actually asking uh, subconsciously his doctor for a way in which he can experience this hormetic stress response and speedily and effectively come out of sympathetic state to the parasympathetic state with incredible ease. Um, and so I say that because very important, again, life will continue to throw curveballs. It will continue to be stressful. What we got to learn is to how to manage this stress better, how to get from that sympathetic state to a parasympathetic state better. And sun theanine can help us do that, especially uh, when we can use this along with other measures uh, that have been proven out. Um, I like to call them biohacking. You can call them, you know, uh, health uh, interventions, whatever it is that you want to uh, call them. And I'm going to share some of those with you now. Before I do, uh, I want to underscore what I heard Braxton say earlier, and that is that theanine or sun theanine particularly, because this is where all the trials, human clinical trials have proven out. Uh, we don't really care so much about the animal trials. That's one stage we have to get to before human clinical trials, of course, become abundant enough to rely on. Uh, but a lot of the other, you know, powders that are out there called L-theanine uh, may not be doing, probably aren't doing what we're seeing sun theanine doing, um, and that is to enhance alpha wave so as to achieve that speed of recovery from sympathetic to parasympathetic state so as to improve focus, attention, alertness, concentration, and relaxation without causing sedation. So we want more of this in life. So not that these other brain waves are bad. Like I suggested before about stress, not all stress is bad. We're meant to deal with acute stress. We have incredible machinery within our bodies to deal with acute stress. But too long of acute stress is like too much gamma brainwave activity, or for that matter, we know about being asleep too many hours a day is also not good. Balance, Goldilocks formula. So this is where sun theanine works to increase alpha brainwave activity. I told you that we're bioelectric beings. This is the electricity and, uh, output, EMG, um, that we're able to actually study. So there's the neurochemistry we look at, the genetics that predispose us to being uh, a particular aptitude within our ability to manage stress. Many of us, uh, again, we have this inability to come back and we stay in this state uh, of stress too long. And as it pertains to the um, um, biochemistry, which we can also test for, as I alluded to, we see that sun theanine helps across all three levels. Can't change your genes, but can manage them better. Can't change, uh, you know, the predisposition, the DNA mom and dad have dealt you, but you can upregulate GABA. You can downregulate the uh, excitatory neurotransmitters when they're too high for too long. Sun theanine helps with that. Um, and it also, of course, on the, uh, the electrical side helps to induce this uh, alpha wave activity. All right. Um, it's important, I believe, to understand as it pertains to sleep, because achieving optimal sleep is, again, not just the hours you clock on the pillow. It's really understanding sleep architecture and then doing what you can to maximize sleep architecture on all aspects, on all facets. So sleep architecture, essentially misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, sleep architecture is really the, the steps, if you will, downward uh, steps to get into your deep recovery phase of sleep and then bounce up into uh, what EMG show us as uh, REM, the rapid eye movement where we're having dreams. Dreams are not the deepest phase of sleep. They are the lightest phase, actually, of sleep, uh, second only to stage one. But when you're dreaming, this is also very important. So if sleep architecture is stage one or a step, and you go down to stage two, three, and four, and bounce up into REM, that's one cycle. Um, that takes the average person about 90 minutes. Some of us are faster, some are a little slower, but that 90 minutes is important. We need five of these different, um, we need to remain in all of these particular uh, phases uh, for certain amounts of time, as you can see here, and we need five of all of these uh, sleep stages, one through five cycles, 
uh, five of them at night. So you could do the quick cowboy math there, uh, five times 90 minutes, that's where you're getting the seven to eight hours recommended by the average um, healthcare uh, practitioner expert. So the other thing I wanted to mention uh, about sleep and the importance of sleep is we just come to realize this was some kind of new uh, information that, um, that I did some deep dive on uh, as it related to writing my last book, and that is the lymphatics. So we know about lymphatics uh, under our arms, inguinal lymph nodes, uh, in our gut or gut-associated lymphoid tissue, 80% of our immune system down there. Very important for detoxifying, managing inflammation, sweeping up the mess after a viral or bacterial uh, war. Um, all of this is very important. But the brain doesn't have lymph. The brain has glial cells. They're non-thinking cells, and they only activate at night. And when they activate, they're in charge of sleeping up the, uh, sweeping up the oxidative stress from the day before. So when you think, when you have thoughts, when you have emotions, when there's neurochemistry and bioelectric chemistry going on, what's left over is oxidative stress. So just by you living and breathing and thinking and being, uh, there is brain toxicity. So one of the major reasons you sleep at night is to activate lymphatic cells. And by activating those lymphatic cells, they're able to then discharge or get rid of the toxins. This is very, very important to understand because we don't spend enough time here. Most of us are stressed out, exhausted, and our bodies want to shut down as hard and fast as possible. That's not necessarily healthy. So you, the individual who falls asleep like this, their partner's talking to them, what are, you, what are you talking to me for? I just fell asleep. Not healthy. Nor is the individual that's taking too long to fall asleep. So there's a Goldilocks formula there as well, and it's typically five to 10 minutes. But the average person doesn't stay asleep or rather stay in stage two for a long enough time. So what's happening is you're, you're hitting the pillow and then within a few minutes hitting stage three. And again, clocking the amount of hours within these stages multiplied by five uh, over the course of the night is the most important thing, the depth of sleep, sleep uh, for recovery and rejuvenation. But if we don't stay in stage two for sort of the amount of time that our body requires, it's kind of akin to shutting down a car engine um, and then the radiator fan doesn't remain going. We've all heard that. So that you turn off the keys to the engine and something's still humming. It's purposeful. Or shutting off a computer and uh, the motherboard fan is not working. You try shutting or turn that computer on again, um, it's probably going to be frozen. So like that, and the reason for this, of course, these fans within uh, mechanical engines or computer technology, after that thing has been operating, it wants to cool down. It needs to cool down in order to function properly the next time you turn it back on. Same with our brain. Our brain needs to cool down. So if we don't remain in that sort of uh, nice alpha wave activity for a long enough period of time, it doesn't segue effectively and can glitch out into stage three and four. So that's really important to keep in mind. Optimal sleep starts with the right amount of alpha wave activity. Uh, for these, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the particular uh, grading and, and staging of the sleep architecture. Uh, we also, we, we want to optimize, we've heard of this uh, sleep hygiene before. We want a very dark room. We want to be comfortable uh, and we want it to be cool. Lymphatics also don't work effectively when the room is too hot. So it's 65 to 68 degrees, believe it or not, uh, is optimal. But for individuals who are having latency or delayed uh, sleep and or are waking up prematurely, we call this advanced day sleep disorder, in both of those instances, and in anyone who feels like their mind is racing and can't fall asleep effectively, um, I always prescribe uh, sun theming in these instances. The elephant in the room, caffeine. It's an incredible nootropic, right? It's a stimulant. We often abuse it. Um, but these are the biohacks I mentioned I get into. Caffeine is nothing I want you to stop. Uh, nothing I ever recommend anyone stop. You know, after 2 or 3 p.m., depending on your genes and how you metabolize, it's probably a good idea. Um, it stays in your system up to, you know, 7 or 8 hours. So the amount matters. Uh, but better with sun theanine. Why? Uh, it turns out that not only does sun theanine improve or enhance your GABAergic function, uh, offset the sympathetic nervous system, the, you know, um, uh, the, the part of uh, the nervous system that's all about fight or flight, which caffeine supercharges, um, it also seems to counteract the negative effects, as you heard uh, Braxton speak to, of caffeine. Um, and so I always recommend the heavy coffee drinker uh, supplement their caffeine or their coffee uh, using Santini to offset those uh, negative effects. 
Meditation, better with Sandini. What are we trying to achieve when we meditate? We're not trying to achieve a mind that thinks of nothing. Uh, that's almost impossible, as any gold robe donning Buddhist monk will tell you. Uh, what you're trying to do is invite thoughts and quiet the mind um, and stay focused. Uh, that's alpha wave. That's exactly what the brain is trying to accomplish. But what the individual is trying to accomplish is a quieted brain in alpha wave. This is enhanced significantly, so uh, supports the literature by adding sun theming, um, you know, about 15 to uh, 20 minutes before a mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction te uh, technique such as meditation. Um, and the other thing that we know is as many as there are, you know, signals from the gut to the brain, this whole gut-brain connection, there's equally or more signals on nerve connections from the heart to the brain. So the heart-brain connection um, is really, you know, now being studied and, and a lot of literature coming down the pipe around how this uh, brain and uh, heart communicate. So there are more connections that go from the heart to the brain, uh, in fact, than there are from the brain to the heart. And that's important because by taking sun theanine, um, what we're actually doing is affecting, again, that ability to transition from sympathetic to parasympathetic state. One of the issuances of that nerve chemistry actually starts in the heart. Might be the seat of emotions, as the traditional Chinese medicine puts it over the last few millennia for this good, very good reason. So when we do focused uh, meditation or mindfulness-based stress reduction, and at the same time use a wearable that looks at heart rate variability, we see sun theanine improves heart rate variability. That is the heart being in a congruent or coherent mode, non-stressed. And by the way, these, this uh, work was done on the military uh, as well as uh, you know some um, uh, average uh, you know folks in the population. And uh, what we saw was an improved heart rate variability. The heart telling the brain everything is going to be okay. Uh, and you can test this for yourself. A lot of heart rate variability devices uh, on the market. So with and without sun theanine, uh, most of us will see a significant difference. Uh, Shinrin Yoku. This is a biohacking method of forest bathing, um, which translates from uh, Japanese to English as forest bathing. So immersing ourselves in nature uh, in order to increase exposure, not just to um, you know greenery, uh, and maybe the loved one or friends that you're walking with, but to negative ions, um, which the flora and fauna release, uh, which boosts serotonin. Um, by amplifying that from you know, taking sun theanine before a Shinrin Yoku or a forest bathing, you're going to see even more upregulation of dopamine through GABA and, uh, and serotonin. So the feel good that you might get out of that experience uh, will be enhanced. We hear a lot about breath work. One of my favorites is box breathing. Um, so four in, hold four, four out, hold four. You can do that anywhere and road rage or you know, stressful meeting at work and you are grounded within you know, minutes. If you know you're expecting, and this is all about preconceived notions, of course, where a lot of stress comes from, um, our anticipation of it, uh, not necessarily the moment of it, uh, of it occurring, but that anticipation, that stressful, um, meeting that you might have at work or, you know, that uh, date that you might be going on uh, that night, whatever the case may be, you can, you know, augment the ability for your body to move from sympathetic to parasympathetic state by taking some sun theanine. There's many chewables that are out on the market and they work very, very well and quite quickly to keep them in your purse or, or your uh, pocket. And you chew those 15 minutes uh, prior to the stressful event along with some box breath. And uh, boy, oh boy, that is going to significantly reduce uh, stress and also keep yourself, your brain, uh, in that level of focus. Um, I do this all the time. In fact, I'm on uh, national television next week doing it live. It was a pre-record and, and, and it'll be uh, on TV across the nation. The purpose of this is not to enjoy being in a uh, freezing environment. Uh, the purpose of this is once again uh, to train the body to be okay with acute stress and over time be faster, naturally, uh, moving from this sympathetic state. Boy, let me tell you, when you're in you know, 40 degree water, you are in sympathetic state. When you come out of the water and you've survived that particular event, uh, your brain starts to remember neoplastic. Our brains connect, disconnect, reconnect more than we ever thought possible. So your brain will start to disconnect from probably will die and reconnect to, I just survived that. 
Um, we hear a lot more about this coin term these days of resilience. This is exactly what this is doing, but better with sun theming. If you do this before, 15 minutes before emerging, 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 yeah, I'll get it straight. A cold immersion, by doing a cold immersion, uh, this will enhance the experience and, of course, again, shift you into that parasympathetic state or uh, rest and digest, relax, state faster. I know I'm coming up to time, so I'll just be quick. The same thing with heat exposure, something you can time with a chewable or, um, uh, or even a swallable, 15 minutes, half an hour before doing a hot sauna. Incredible uh, to, again, expose your body to and create heat shock proteins, expose your body to that little bit of Goldilocks amount of stress. Um, and, and one of the purposes of this is, of course, uh, to become more resilient. Um, there are all kinds of devices out in the market. TDCS uh, stands for transcranial direct current stimulation. And you can put these um, pads that deliver an electrical current in different parts of the brain. This one here is focused on the prefrontal cortex um, in a manner that it's sending a signal that's actually going to enhance firing of those particular nerves um, and various pathways that science has mapped up. If you were to take sun theming prior uh, to doing a TDCS, we have shown um, in smaller studies that it actually enhanced those neural pathways. So once again, this is the nerves that fire together, wire together. The more you're able to essentially prove out that you are uh, not as stressed as you otherwise would have been, you know, um, entered that particular environment, uh, and the more that you come out of these experiences, uh, the more these nerves fire together, uh, the more able you are to deal and manage with stress, resilience. Um, and last but not least, yoga, for sure better with sun theming, as is uh, massage. Um, I'll just end off in saying, you know, this is not just white paper uh, research that I've done, uh, what I might have been exposed to in the you know, literature or applying this with patients over the last 20 plus years. Um, I have, uh, you know, spent the last 12 or 13 or so years traveling the globe, boots on the ground, into the manufacturers, uh, the, the places that make the raw materials that supply, uh, you know, uh, amazing companies like uh, NutriScience. So I've been there, boots on the ground, seeing uh, these manufacturers and how and what they produce. Um, and I visited um, Taiwan both in Japan. Uh, those are the uh, tea leaves behind me there, which, by the way, of course, we've come to learn, you can't, it's prohibitively expensive to extract theanine from green tea. Um, so there aren't really anyone, uh, there's no one doing that. It's a fermentation process that's going to yield the L isomer in the way that we want it uh, for safety efficacy. Um, and there I am in uh, India uh, visiting uh, the uh, Thai Lucid uh, uh, conglomerate um, and wanted to say, uh, to leave off with this whole notion, and I'm pretty sure we're clear at this point, to achieve therapeutic response is not to drink green tea. Um, green tea, you know, four to maybe 10 at the most milligrams for average cup of green tea, more in matcha. Um, I was also blessed to be able to do um, a, a deep uh, dive and, and um, a documentary with uh, some Buddhist monks at the ba a base of Mount Kibisan in Japan to learn more about how they meditate and and they drink a lot of green tea, you know, upwards of maybe 10 cups a day. So they might be achieving therapeutic range. Therapeutic range in a clinical setting, what I offer my patients, what I take myself, is between 200 milligrams once to twice a day. Uh, that's what you're going to get with sun theanine, um, and, and that's what ultimately uh, you want to achieve. That range that's going to get you that sharper mind focus, attention, alertness, concentration, all while having... Um, you know, more of a state of relaxation, better sleep, um, and overall, um, you know, less stress. And I will leave it uh, there.